Well, going back from when we were very young in the family home in, in Balaki, we were always seeing drumming, we were always hearing pipe band conversations, and indeed we were much more educated, believe it or not, in our youth, uh, owing to hearing uh, those types of conversations about piping and drumming and pipe bands and and uh, than our age would have normally allowed us. But uh, starting off to drum, you know, every every young player wants to be a uh, world champion, you know, and that's a big thing, and it's it's a great great thing to have and aspire to. And although immediately we weren't. We were more bothered about uh, being able to play like my dad. So we were uh, more so than than prizes. And uh, so whenever people would come to the house and get taught at the house, we would be standing watching. And because we saw so much of it, we nearly we we, we nearly. Uh, uh, thought to ourselves that we were actually doing it because we'd seen so much of it. And uh, we couldn't understand why a lot of guys that came to the house and that it, uh, they were having trouble with it. And we were looking at them and saying to ourselves, my goodness, come on, sure anybody can do that, you know, because it was so normal. And uh, so from then, from then on, uh, of course, I started with uh, one and three quarter sticks. I didn't have a full pair. So getting a full pair was something to aspire to as well, because my two older brothers who were already playing uh, in the band with my dad. And uh, so they had they had to get a full stick each. So it was uh, and I started off playing uh, the other way round, and every chance when well, my dad wasn't looking, every chance I caught, I would go back to playing Corey handed or Kitter handed or whatever way it's ex explained nowadays. And then uh, eventually, I after a few stern tellings off, I uh, started playing the same as. as uh, Bobby and Tommy and, and and Daddy. So, but at the age of four, I remember playing my dad's two parts of my dad's competition march, which was Willie Grace farewell to the Glasgow Police, and uh, I still remember it to this day. And it's uh, it's probably more difficult to play today than it was back then because of all the other types of techniques that that we've had. Uh, so it's a wee bit of a task going back to to administer that in the nice round fashion that we that we played it and in, in, in when we were so very young. And uh, so then in the in the sixties, my dad he uh, he took a a bad back and uh, he was uh, teaching teaching bands all over the country. And uh, even as a band practices, I would go with them to uh, Tully Lag and to Club first of all, it was probably the first, yes, and then other places that he was teaching, and then to Tully Lag where Bobby and Tommy eventually went. And then my dad was getting unknowing to me, he was getting me ready to be available to play in a band that was short of drummers. And uh, so that's how it got started in the in the band. And the very first night I was there, we were playing uh, an MSR in grade three. And this would be the winter of 1965. And um, so uh, we were playing a, a Mars of Spain reel, and uh, we had ins and outs, or unison, or chips, whatever you want to call it. 
So then each of us had a turn at lead and drum, the two guys I was playing along with, and then uh, the, the two guys played the lead and drum, and then the pipe major, uh, William Wonkerson, he asked if if I could try it. You see, so it seemed to him a lot more stable and a lot more uh, a lot more uh, tempo wise, a lot more stable uh, throughout the performance. And breaks were good, and I was always eager and uh, willing to wait on on commands. So he found this quite good. So needless to say, we were very late that night at the practice, and uh, he said then that he wanted me playing the, the lead drum, and uh, rest, rest was history. Uh, solos at that time, uh, we had a lot of help from uh, Annie Shaw, and. Uh, I used to hear uh, my dad and them coming with new beatings that Ernie that Ernie would compose, and then of course their material at that time would have been maybe a wee bit out of my reach, and but that didn't stop me from trying to to emulate and copy, you know. So uh, and it that it grew it grew very fast. Till uh, up through the grades and solos and that. Till uh, I think the first world solos I entered, I was eighth, I think. Then it was fourth, then it was second, then it was first. So uh, I was I was happy enough uh, because I really the sort of glory that. Is attached with it nowadays, uh, to a certain extent. It it wasn't in my thinking at all. I just wanted to play the way Alec Duthard could play, you know, and Billy Stevenson and Jim Hutt and Bert Barr. So uh, my reward was feeling that I could play uh, like them. And uh, of course, the schooling from my dad. Stood me in good stead in so far as um, we were taught how to listen. You know, and to pay attention and give anything that we did the attention it deserved. So it was a very, a very good grounding uh, for later years. Well, uh, the fairly together. Actually, my dad started the fairly together. I just, I just gave it a name, and uh, I didn't realise this at the time. It's only later in life when I look back. But everything that we played in the in the we learned the melodies of tunes when we were very young. Also, with hearing so much of it, my dad had a real tip recorder and he used to take bands all over the place. And we would be, whenever they would be playing to people that was in maybe a recording of a competition at Bangor or then we would get to know the tunes, you see. We loved the tunes. But any time my dad was teaching, he would always put a tune to whatever he was teaching. So rudiments in exercise form, they didn't seem that appealing. You know, and and still doesn't to this day. But when you play it to a melody, then of course the melody commands. The uh, melody commands the the pupil and the instructor to do to play to the melody. And uh, so we would play uh, maybe a two bar phrase or maybe a one bar phrase. Didn't matter, but we would keep, we would play it to a tune. And there was times within that, uh, whereby um, we would have to slightly alter the rudiment to suit either the timing of the melody or maybe a wee triplet in the melody or a, a, a strike 
Portakam or, you know. So uh, we would automatically adjust to that. And uh, it was, a, it was a, a nice thing to be able to do, although we weren't aware we were learning that. But the whole thing about the fairly together concept is that everything that you play, if you're only playing one beat every uh, in a, a two-four time, saying you're only playing, so you could get pretty much any kid to do that, and. So if the instructor and the pupil sitting down to do that, so one on the right, one on the left, then the pupil is bound by the same commands as the instructor because they have the tune to contend with, for the want of a better word. So the tune commands, even the most basic of all rudiments, which is a tap, the tune commands it to be in the right place. This was musicality that grew on us, and we didn't know it because we had to be stay within the bounds of the tune, the bounds of the beat. And uh, so within the realms of the tune, uh, people who could play even the most simplest, ridiculously basic thing doesn't matter what the tune was, you would still be bound by the beat. Whereas if you were playing on your own and you were just playing, ah, that's right, one more leg. You know, and no regular fluency, there's no rhythm, there's no meaning, there's no adjusted weight. That was another thing we were doing, was adjusting weight to suit. Uh, and we also made drumming like. Uh, conversation. Even we're sitting here just now, Derek, and you're you asked me a question there in certain voice pitches. Well, you can do that with Roman too, and that's what we did because if I was to do, uh, if I was to say to somebody, play dig at the blub, put at the blub, so. That's the way my dad taught me to play with his mouth. So I would have played dig at the blub, but at the blub. Exactly the same voice pitch with the sticks. So then if he said play uh but at the blub, but but at the blub. And of course you get ready to be a wee bit more bolder. Say blig it up, put at the blub, but a put at the blig it at the blub. The same up and down, variances in conversation and as we do in our voice, you know, to from a newsreader to to being poetic, you know, and in the crude way of saying that, everybody can say, "Ba ba black sheep, have you any wool?" That yes, sir, yes, sir. So you imagine forgetting, but how much? Anyway, so and that's taught us. To be more poetic, like um, I wandered lonely as a clock. So, so it was a, it was a. Again, no matter how basic the rudiment was, you were always using it in destination use. So the destination use of you had eighteen pipers standing there and say, "Right, John, we're going to play a jig," and I say, "Oh my goodness, I've never played a jig before. I'll just have to." Tap in time to the jig. So you tap away in time to the jig. So everyone's calculated there. So that is in destination use. So that's what the fairly together concept is that both the instructor and the pupil or beginner is bound by the commands. Of of the tune, so we would we would have, as I said, we would have all these phrases, and especially in six eight, six eight was very. Uh, my dad loved six eights, and he used to carry me up back and forth across the floor, 
to six eights. And we would have sayings for certain melody phrases. And like, uh, if I was going to sing, I would be, you know, uh, the tunes that he rehearsed at that time was probably Old Adam. <laughs> so that would be Bali be Yumpalalidal. So we, we always timed it with voice. And when Dad was to me, he timed it with voice. And I unknowingly only copied the sound he made. So a sound is, uh, if you can say it, you can play it. You know, like, uh, so then I would just play the same. You know, and if you were, if you're going, I would play. And then uh, it could be, uh, or or it up, up, or up, 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 in later years, when you think back over that, you can turn this into a tool to 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 be used. And uh, so, in destination use, doesn't matter what you're playing. That's the fairly together concept. So, if a, if a pupil or beginner plays the tune, uh, if he can play even the most, uh, one time I was at a school. I should tell you, and uh, I took time out purposely to show this class that was very, very basic. And we went over this, it took several minutes, a wee bit of time was spent on it. And they were actually playing one of the most difficult rudiments in pipe band snare drumming to me, and that was the buzz. So I had them playing it, albeit slow. So if I was to whistle the tune to them, to their capability in playing buzz, it would be. You see? So from then, uh, you're actually shifting responsibility more onto the student because it's now apparent to them that the band isn't going to play the tune at that tempo. So, but at, at the only tempo they can manage, it's still in, in destination use. But now the student knows how far away he is from perfecting that uh, at a performing tempo. So uh, that's the way I, I always put the onus on them to say, well, you know, we can go out in the street, play that tune at that tempo, you know, so it needs a bit of work. And also, um, so that requires quite a bit of trust. And the reason I'm saying trust is that when young players look and they listen to a, a tune being played by a band on the radio or a DVD or anything, they absolutely try and copy it. So they copy what they're hearing and what they're seeing. And they're some of them never know that that's not really the sound that's being created. So it's not that that they should emulate. It's they have to find out what them guys are doing that produced that sound. 
And very often, when they hear it, when it's broke down for them and, and played in the way that that causes it to be so good a sound, they would be mistrusting of it. So then they take a wee bit of convincing then that that's, you need to do that to produce that. So emulation and copying, yes, it has its uses, but you have to be careful with it when you when you get up a wee bit in a, in a, in a wee bit better standard of playing, because it can it can make you it can make you happy with settling for second best, and that's that's not a good thing. I never certainly I was never happy settling for second best. I did emulate and I emulated slightly wrong, but that only happened a few times till I started to look. Uh, more close at the way the tools were being used, the hands and the sticks. So they, it's not, you can't copy the sound. You have to find out what is being done to make that sound that you thought was so lovely in the first place. But uh, so the Fairly Together concept uh, addresses all these issues. Some knowingly, some unknowingly, and uh, it's a it's a good defensive mechanism as well, and uh, it's it's a thing that the student can he can employ or implement these conditions at home. You know, by getting the student played slow, and he sticks to the commands. So it's really not his thinking because he'll have too much of his head on. But he needs to get the head on of what the tune desires, you know. So uh, all these all these processes and everything is all uh, is all evident to the experienced guy in the fairly together concept program. The, again, you know, I go back to the simple, basic rudiments, and uh, just the same as I did when I was young, because these these don't uh, these don't play out. These are forever. They're evergreen rudiments, and uh, like even single taps in each hand. Uh, basic triplets, flams, drags, everything. Even in the most basic form, I play them slow to tease out control. So uh, a lot of people is lose a wee bit on the control because everybody thinks if you play some fast that that you're good, or you can play heavy. You know, that means you're good, you know, not at all. Uh, I wouldn't like to speak the way I know some guys play because I would be shouting like this all the time, you know. So that wouldn't be very descriptive and I wouldn't certainly get the job reading the news. But um, so the Fairly Together concept is all uh, dealing with control, not the way you want to do it all the time. You know, everybody has a boss. In the drummer's case, it's the tune. Apart from the, the administered beat from the pipe major, beat from whatever. But so the tune is boss, and you you allow the timing of notes uh, in the same tempo as the tune. And they will take you to the end of the phrase. You don't need to decide when the end of the phrase is going to be. Like a, a roll pulse. If I was playing a single tap roll, like um, all I'm doing there is keeping the notes true. And at that tempo, 
them true notes will take me to the end of the phrase perfectly. It's the same with a roll. You just time a roll pulse, the same as you would time a single tap. And allow that the speed, pace, whether it's a tight pulse, slow pulse, and it will take you to the end. Two, three pace rolls is, is, uh, is 13 taps. And when you apply them in perfect time, then uh, you you wouldn't rush the taps. You see? But if you were rolling that, you go You see? You can't do that. You got so uh, you, you control the role with that. Everything is geared to the tune. The fairly together concept is an experienced instructor will get as much out of it as what a student will. And maybe even more because they have extra tools that they can employ within the, the, the musical beat. But uh, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, for basic rudiment exercises to be played to a tune. Probably the biggest failure that a lot of instructors have today is they don't know the tunes, you know. And even if you know a tune, you can shift the tune into different type signatures and play to it. So you're getting everything that you're playing in destination use, not at performing tempo, because that only comes with practice and experience, but it's still destination use. When we started, as I say, I had one and three quarter sticks, we had a bit of old lino and it was nailed with carpet tacks to a bit of wood. And uh, nowadays, of course, they have all the gear. And uh, so I would never blame sticks that I'm playing with. I would never blame a pad. You know, they only do what you're doing with them. You know, so I always look at myself, you know, rather than the tools. But, um, uh, Get the right sound. Get the right. Now, some guys will lift their hands up high to do a move, and that's fine for them. Flare. They can play with flare. Now, a beginner, what's the first thing a beginner is going to copy? Is the flare. Big mistake. Flare is the last thing you put in. The first thing you got to do is, is the contact point in time? And you do whatever it takes to make it on time, whether you slow down the stick travel. See? See? Or easy on the eye and easy on the ear. So if I go so you see there the flow of the hand. But if I go, tuck, 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 well, that's, that's a precipice. Hard on the eye and it's hard on the ear. Be fluent from the forearm. It's like um, there's some notes you can't do that with. Some notes you have to have quite a bit of power into them from a low height. You know, it's like a my dad's van, the door in my dad's van, you had a surprise at, you know. And if you if you went to the door and you say, so oh, I'm gonna close this, well it wouldn't wouldn't shut. It just wouldn't close. And he used to he used to get mad. But if you brought the door till about there, and then Door closed. See? 
So if I was a, a boxer and I was going to hit my opponent and I pulled back like this and I'm going to, he's probably going to step out of the way and I'll end up in a heap in the corner. But if I start jabbing him nine inches, then he's not going to see that coming because it's too quick. And the stick is the same thing. You have notes to put in at a, a low a low height, and you still need the power to get the definitiveness and the execution. If you don't have an execution, it's, everything is a, a very, very moderate effect. There's no, you know, piping is all about execution. Clarity of note, musicality, and uh, drumming. Drumming's the same. With right-handed and left-handed players, I started playing this way. See, so this was my left hand, left hand grip on the right hand, a right hand grip on the left hand. So how do you write that above and below the line? You know, uh, it's all right if everybody just turns everything round about and they just say, well, you know, the grip. This grip is going to be classed as the right hand, and this grip is going to be classed as the as the, as the left hand. Getting back to the boxer, the boxer makes a a left hook. He never makes a right hook. If you all the main rally cars in the world are pretty much all left hand drive, because the two sides of our body is not the same. And that's why there's, a, there's an effect to be had uh, as, as to what we're accustomed to the sound of playing that grip. So, um, I mean, there's plenty of great players play, play the, the other grip. But just... Uh, to me, every detail sound may may need a wee bit of extra effort that sometimes isn't going in. Uh, for young players, it's uh, you need good instructors. There's more better instructors now than ever there's been ever. And uh, where I was lucky with my dad, my dad would have had maybe a wee quiver on his roll, maybe in the right hand now and again. Well, I didn't copy that because he didn't show it to me because he told me to play it with his mouth because he couldn't use his hands. So again, I was learning by sound. Per up. It's not, uh, if I was doing a nine stroke roll uh, and it would go per up to per up, plop, per up, you see. So that's not. That's not there's a there's a pair and it's late on the end. Whereas if you go purr up to purr up plop purr up, you see, that's exactly the right length. And you're providing clarity for the pipes, you're not clouding the execution on the pipes. It's important for kids to to learn the sounds accurately. With as many little or no bad habits uh, from the from the instructor. My impressionable years were there was little competing for my time. Someone was the only was the thing was all we could do. But nowadays kids are with all the push button stuff uh, is shallow on the brain. Whereas Drummond and the likes is uh, because it's physical and it's much more deeper in the brain and installed uh, firmly for, for, for life. So uh, the, the attitude to all the patterns about the tools and the way that you use the stick above and below the note, up and down stroke, 
not to rush the air time. You can be in front of the airspeed and it'll look not right. And then it'll, you'll not be forgiven, even if it does sound okay. But if you're, if you're fluent to where you want to go uh, in time and the, when you're starting from the holding position, I start there. And when I play the note, the preparation and recovery takes me from there to there and back to there. So I don't tie the lift. If I went one, two, <gasps> no, I'll go there. One, two. See, so I'm only going one direction and I'll be on time because I've only, I'm only moving one way and I won't move that stick till it's time to sound the note. Very, very definitive and very efficient looking. So uh, these are all the wee things that, that I teach students and they, again, they maybe don't know the value, whereas I'm more concise about the striking of the note. And then later on, we know where we need to be in the contact and we build in the flare round about the sounding of the note not the sounding of the note built in round about the flare. So that's them's all useful things that I would say in, uh, for young beginners and, and uh, elementary and intermediate players, even experienced guys.